Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Extra Serving, a Nation's Restaurant News Podcast. I'm your host, Holly Petrie, here at the latest episode, and I'm here to introduce my lovely co-host for the episode. I am Sam Mokus, Editor-in-Chief of Nation's Restaurant News. I am Leanne Zinsmeister, Managing Editor of NRN. And I am Senior Food and Beverage Editor, Brett Thorne. Welcome, everyone. Yes, welcome. Thanks. Thanks. To Hello. those who are watching, Sam is in a new location, though it looks the same. Yes, I have I have moved. Um, but yeah, I, I am apparently a very boring aesthetic because I set up a new shelf and I and everybody, everybody has pointed out that my new shelf looks just like my old shelf. So I did not I have, do that. Okay, that's true. That's fair. Holly did though. Um, Brett, I don't think you've had an opportunity to say it yet, but I no, this like is my first time seeing you, but I, I will say that you're nice to look at anyway, Sam. Oh, thanks, Brett. <laughs> that means a lot. I was very proud of you guys for flying up, flying solo last week. Good job. Good job. You handled things without me. Did you listen? Yeah. That was totally a lie. That was a total <laughs> lie. <laughs> I listened to part of it. That counts, right? What if we left like Easter eggs? Like, oh, if Sam listens, he'll definitely comment on this. <laughs> You know how and I know like, Sam oh, didn't sure. listen? Because I said, I said, I missed Sam. And Sam would have commented on it if he heard that. And that's how I know he wasn't listening. Because I know you definitely didn't miss me. See, I, that's how I know that he wasn't listening. Because wow. he would have commented if, I, if he heard me say that. I listened to the beginning. I just wanted to see how much you guys did miss me. Miss me. But at the beginning of it, you're like, well, well, let's just plug away. So I'm like, all right, well, fine, they're fine without me. See, that's how I knew you didn't listen. Because I said... You know, I really did miss Sam. I said it pretty, pretty soon on. So you know what? You really did not listen to much of the podcast. <laughs> that, does, that means that I trust you. Caught red-handed. I trust you. That's all. <laughs> that's good. All right. Well, um, Leanne, you went on an exciting trip this week. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it? I did. I was down in Baton Rouge um, on Monday and Tuesday with Raising Canes. Uh, they host an event usually every year, but this was the first time they've done it since 2019 where they invite, well, they don't invite, they fly out their newest employees to Baton Rouge, which is where Raising Canes was founded. And they try to immerse their employees into Baton Rouge and show them really like the core of the brand and what it's about. Um, Raising Canes is expanding quickly. They're going to be in New York City later this year, I think, or maybe next year. Um, so their goal with this is really to make sure that they're maintaining their Louisiana culture at all of their units. Um, so they invited me down to tag along and record everything that was going on. Um, and it was a lot of fun. There was a crawfish boil. There was, we visited the first three Raising Canes locations. We took a store, took a tour of the stadium at LSU. I got to go down on the field. Um, I'm a Pac-12 girl, but that was still pretty cool. So it was a really great event. Everyone I talked to had nothing but great things to say about it. Um, and yeah, I had a great time. I'm glad they invited me. You'll be able to see more about that um, on our Instagram account in the hopefully near future. Um, so yes, I, it was it was a great event. I think it's a great way to maintain your culture as you grow into, you know, Raising Cane started as just the one location in Baton Rouge. And now they're a huge, I think they have more than 650 stores now. So I'm psyched yeah, you know, about them. I'm psyched about them coming to New York because I hear they're awesome, even though it's just chicken tenders and Texas toast and cane sauce. But my, my nephew went to Tulane and and uh, was a big fan when he was there. It's it's very simple, straightforward, but it's delicious, which counts for something for sure. Um, you know, I, I think, Leanne, you, you know, mentioning that word culture, it's funny because you... I feel like the restaurant industry has been talking about culture for 10 years at least, maybe more. But right now, the conversation is more about retention and, you know, culture being a very key part of that. So it's interesting because, you know, I've, I've, there have been a lot of these things kind of pop up where we see companies hosting franchisee conventions or, you know, just sort of in person. Now that we can do these in person things again, this is a really key component to that idea of retention. Because if you can sell your employees and your franchisees, 
on the system and keep them around, then that's a big solution to the labor issue going on today. Not just how do I find employees, but how do I keep everybody happy and make sure that they're invested in what we're doing? And it also helps you maintain the culture if you keep the employees who understand the culture. Yeah. And I think it shows the employees that the company, you know, cares about them. It's a big investment to fly. I think there were 300 people there this week, you know, flew in 300 employees from different parts of the country, put them up in a hotel overnight. Um, You know, it shows that they they're willing to invest in their employees and therefore the employees are willing to, you know, give it their all and really invest in the brand. That's great. And then Brett, you actually went to the CKE headquarters. They had some big news this week as well. Yes, I went to Franklin, Tennessee um, and was struck by how they wear masks differently in the Nashville area in that in New York. We wear masks a fair amount, but we often wear them badly with our noses sticking out. And I want to I want to say to people, hey, it's been a couple of years now. If you're going to wear a mask, like I know how to wear shoes, but I don't like wearing <laughs> shoes, but I do it and I do it correctly. Same with a mask in Tennessee. Not a lot of masks, but the people who wore the masks wore them correctly. And that was that was nice to see. But mostly I spent the time at the CKE, CKE headquarters in Franklin, Tennessee, where they showed me some stuff that is still a secret for another week. But I also talked to them about their rebranding, uh, which involves a lot of upgrading of their of the physical space, but especially the outside, because more of their customers are going through the drive through and never, never cross the threshold of the actual interior of the restaurant. So that's their big focus. In the meantime, they're, they're still working on a lot of the moving parts of their rebranding, including trimming down the menu, and they're experimenting with a bunch of new equipment and technology, things like better uh, oil filters so that uh, the staff who don't want to clean the the oil or change the oil don't have to do it as often, which also is really a retention play as well as a clean oil play. Uh, and then they're working on different types of possibly AI that they can use. And, and they're just, uh, it's a whole refocus on what, uh, what the the company is doing internally and how they present that externally. And there's there's a lot of rebranding going on these days, or they're calling it rebranding no matter what it is. Like Noodles & Company, what, last week? Just said, we're rebranding, and it's our new, our new brand positioning is uncommon goodness, which sounds nice, but really the fundamentals of it are a bunch of new benefits for their employees, including stock options for managers and payment for like reimbursal for life things, anything from medical medical care to mental health. They will pay, I think, up to $625 a year for you to have your home clean. So that's pretty cool. Another labor thing, right? I mean, another retention mm-hmm. a way to make your people happy. Although what I think is interesting about that, to your point, Brett, is, you know, usually when you said, you, it used to be when in the past you say rebrand, of course, you're, you're updating the logo, a new color palette, maybe doing some upholstery on your furniture in your restaurant, whatever. And, and so now it feels like there's this more sort of comprehensive, holistic approach to rebranding that's going on that has to take into account the state of the restaurant industry, which has to take into account the labor thing. So even going back to back of the house in the kitchen, how do you make things simpler, more efficient for your employees so that they're happier working there? Because if they have to change out the oil themselves and they grumble about it, well, they're probably going to look for other jobs where they don't have to do that. So it is really interesting to see these holistic rebrand approaches that are not just hey, customers, look how shiny, flashy, and new we are, but also, hey, employees, look how much we're modernizing and making things better for you, too. That's true. And, you know, but before the pandemic, labor was the number one issue. And as we uh, work through the pandemic, labor is even more of a crucial issue. And it's, it's just always an issue in the restaurant industry. It's an issue in every industry. Labor well, is these days, for sure. <laughs> Right. Labor is just an issue. <laughs> yep. 
So, so Sam, I would like for you guys to play to pay to have my apartment clean, please. I think it's going to cost more than six hundred and twenty-five dollars just for one time, Brett. Wow! So you've, you you haven't even seen my apartment, but you've heard my stories. Your stories are a little scary. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I would want to clean your apartment, Brett. But having just had some carpets cleaned, I can tell you what. Oof, cleaning is not cheap. <laughs> and it's not awesome. And and now that I am basically making daily trips to Target and Lowe's, they are not sponsoring this episode, but Target and Lowe's have been real lifesavers for me, having just moved. Not picking Lowe's and not Home Depot. Well, well, I'm. it's funny you shout that out because I was a Home Depot guy, but there is not a Home Depot within five miles of my new home, but there's like 14 Lowe's within five miles of my new home. So just a clean Apparently Columbus is more of a Lowe's city than a Home Depot city. Um, and, but point being is who inflation, whoa, <laughs> because these receipts that I'm, yeah, it's this stuff ain't cheap. And yeah, so to furnish a house in this era, not well, you're buying thing. things like tire swings. Those are quite expensive. That was a very nice, that was a very nice outdoor oh, swing my, you bought those oh. children. I didn't buy it. No, I, I've had that for years. That, but, but yes, I did put up my new, my, my um, old swing, but I did buy fancy. them. We did buy them. Um, like uh, we had to buy like an outdoor toy holder, you know, you got to throw all your toys into, I mean, the thing, I don't, I don't even want to say how much it costs. Cause I'm kind of embarrassed how much money I'm paying for these things, but, but you know, it's just inflation is real. And um, yeah, customers are feeling it. I don't remember how we started this conversation, but yeah, it ends with me saying inflation is real. But I want my apartment clean. Yes. Oh, yeah. right, right, right. Oh, I'm I'm oh, trying yeah. to divert you guys from asking me for more benefits is what I'm trying to do. Yes. Oh. <laughs> well, we can talk about inflation because we're talking about uh, all of the earnings that have come up. Uh, Leanne, you are yeah. our earnings expert. Um, we've still had more earnings. They are not ending yet. Um, so please tell us more about the earnings, which I know consisted of a lot of talk about inflation and what's going to happen with inflation. Yeah, it was definitely um, way fewer earnings than last week. I'm sure our listeners are like, please don't let this woman talk about earnings again because they just went on and on last week. Um, but yeah, you know, it's the same trends as always. Inflation, prices. Um, as far as I could tell, every brand that we covered earnings for this week reported an increase in same store sales, which is great. Um, generally, restaurants are recovering. Um, first watch is a chain that I'm always interested to look at because they went public so recently. Um, and they were also one of the only restaurant brands not to give in to menu price increases until early this year. They didn't increase prices at all in 2021. Um, so they've now raised prices a little bit this year. They say they still have room to increase more if they need to. Um, but their same store sales were up 27%. In the first quarter, even though they cited, you know, uh, um, Omicron happened in Q1, um, they have, they're based in Florida, I want to say, but they have a lot of units up north and they said, you know, winter weather was rough this year, but they still managed to grow traffic and sales. Um, and they're saying that as they look at Q2 so far, they saw like huge numbers on Mother's Day. Um and then similar things at Texas Roadhouse, which was the other full service company to report this week. Um, they have raised menu prices again. Um, their same store sales were up 16% at company units, 20% at franchises. Uh, both of those brands talked a lot about technology that they're developing and implementing. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that talk, um, especially at full service brands, things like paying at the table. Um, wait lists. First watch has a new like kitchen display system that they're using that now the units that have it are performing better than the ones that don't. Um, so those are the trends of the full service units. We also, um, saw same store sales increases at sweet green, um, which Holly covered this week and shake shack, which Brett covered. Um, both of those fast casual companies have said that their suburban stores are outperforming their city units. Um, Shake Shack's been saying that for a long time. Sweet Green is just starting to crack into suburban markets, and they're already seeing that trend. Um, same store sales are up for both of them. And then over at El Pollo Loco, same store sales are up almost 8%. 
um, because of Berea. Am I saying that right, Brett? You know, it depends. Some people say Berea, some say Berea. So uh, if any of any of the listeners want to let us know how they pronounce it, let Whatever us know. Whatever you call it, you it's call? very trendy right now. Um, it's driving sales at El Pollo Loco. They also launched a huge like TikTok influencer campaign. Um, so things are things were good in the earnings world this week. Things are going well, I would say, in spite of the continued inflation. Now, Lisa Jennings just reported yesterday that inflation growth is slowing, um, but it's definitely still there. So going to continue to be a concern. So that's my financial update. <laughs> Well, thank you for that. It's so informative. We love to get a good financial update from you, Leanne. Oh, good. <laughs> Any thoughts, Sam, Brett? Well, I, you know, we are getting ready our top 500 report for June. So um, just to piggyback off of what Leanne's talking about with full service restaurants, we, we have the data, we've looked through the data and just to tell you, spoiler alert, the resurgence of full service restaurants is, I mean, just insane, uh, which I mean, you can kind of expect for how hard they were hit in 2020. Their 2021 numbers are just as much of a swing back. But one thing I'll comment on that is really interesting. It kind of speaks to some of the things that Leanne was just talking about that the companies are reporting is it seems like the average unit growth is really outpacing the, I'm sorry, average, average unit volume growth is really outpacing the unit growth. So in other words, sales per restaurant is increasing more than actual new restaurants being built, which tells me that restaurants are getting more money out of each individual location. So this, you know, it's kind of apples and oranges, but it's a, it's a good way to say, you know, how do you compare restaurants today versus what was going on in the pandemic? Well, look at their average unit volume because, you know, how much money they're getting out of each restaurant. Um, this is across the board, full service and quick service, which is, um, restaurants are becoming more efficient. They're using tools to get more, they're turning customers over more quickly in full service restaurants, which means you can, and they're doing that through technology and automation and other things. So anyway, those are all things we're looking at for the top 500. And I just think from the sales reporting we've had in the last couple of weeks, it's, it's there, we have some hints at what's really driving some of those increases across full service restaurants, but really the whole industry. Well, and I think the, the pandemic, really helped, as awful as it has been, it helped restaurants get better, leaner, stronger, faster, because they had to. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And now this is our last regular episode before the NRA show. Right. So yes. we are about to go into NRA show craziness. Uh, next about week. you. <laughs> I've been there for weeks. <laughs> yeah, we've been in the thick of it. Next week is our first NRA preview uh, scheduled podcast. Then we will have some podcasts live from the show. So get ready for those. Um, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be really energetic. We're ready to be back at the show. We're ready to be in Chicago again. Um, so it's going to be great. I get into Chicago Tuesday. I'm there for an entire week. Um, so I am ready to go I'm pumped up uh so it's gonna be exciting uh, i'm already exhausted <laughs> i'm already exhausted thinking about being at the nra show me too i'm excited i'm already packed i'm excited. i mean look i i haven't been to chicago in three years it's one of my favorite cities in the world so i'm super excited to be back in chicago and i'm excited to see a lot of people i haven't seen in a long time but yeah whew. it's a this show is a doozy and i need to be sleeping now rest up everybody Yep. <laughs> so Brett, why don't you tell us about who you interviewed today? You know, it is so incredibly appropriate because what I've been thinking as you guys are talking about, you got to be energized, you got to be jazzed, I'm tired, I need a nap. What we all need is coffee. And my guest this week is Felton Jones, the chief roaster of PJ's Coffee in New Orleans. And uh, he's a really interesting guy. We talk about how he got in to being a coffee judger, you know, how he, how he developed his, his palate for judging and appreciating coffee and the whole processes of purchasing and roasting coffee and the current special flavor 
uh, that PJ's coffee has at the moment, which is wedding cake coffee, uh, and uh, which, which spoiler alert, is mostly vanilla and almond. Uh, but he also talks about how PJ's has benefited from being in New Orleans during all these supply chain issues because New Orleans is a major import center for coffee into the United States. So the challenge is more getting the coffee out to the different PJ's coffee restaurants. That's more difficult than actually getting the coffee from abroad. There are many interesting things that Felton and I talk about, and I think you're all going to enjoy it. Can't wait to listen to it. And I'm sure everybody else will love it. If they've stayed this long, they're going to stay for the interview. Of course. (laughs) Well, thank you all so much for being here. And we will talk to everyone next week for the NRA show. Whoa. Can't wait.